You know, I personally believe that it's impossible to understand Bible prophecy without understanding the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel. I say that because the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel give us a lot of valuable information about the key players in the tribulation and about the sequence of events and even the events that are going to take place during that time. In fact, these two books actually lay the foundation on which the book of Revelation is built. In fact, as I was going through the book of Revelation, I realized I'm going to be in trouble if I don't start now studying the book of Daniel. And so I was actually studying the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation at the same time while I was preparing for this series. That's how important these books are. And I'll give you some examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. Because of Daniel, we know that the first horseman of the apocalypse is the Antichrist. Also because of the book of Daniel, we know that he is actually going to broker a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. We also know that he's going to build or let them rebuild the temple. But contrary to what most people think, when the Antichrist first comes on the scene and he begins to ascend in power, not all of the nations are going to support him. And we know that because of the book of Ezekiel. If it wasn't for the book of Ezekiel, we might not know that. And that is the reason that World War III begins shortly after the tribulation starts. In fact, the second horseman of the apocalypse actually initiates... World War III. And the book of Ezekiel gives us a lot of information about that war. It reveals the countries that are involved. It tells us who starts the war and why. It also tells us how it ends and how God is going to use it to accomplish his goals or his plan. If you remember last week, I told you that God has five goals that he wants to accomplish during the tribulation. He is going to use World War III to accomplish some of those goals. Now, without the books of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel, we wouldn't know all of this. That's why I say that it's impossible to understand the book of Revelation without understanding these two books. So before we study the second horseman of the apocalypse, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the book of Daniel. And then, when we study the second horseman of the apocalypse, we're also going to study Ezekiel's, Ezekiel chapters 37, 38, and 39. And as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to refer back to these two books from time to time. So let's do a quick overview of the parts in Daniel that are pertinent to the book of Revelation. And I hope you know that when I say quick, I don't mean 20 or 30 minutes. I mean two to three weeks, possibly four. That is a quick overview of the book of Daniel. But we have to do it. And the reason we have to do it is because the book of Daniel is the key to understanding certain parts of the book of Revelation. And we're at one of those parts. If I just tell you that, oh yeah, the second horseman of the apocalypse comes on the scene and World War III starts and then I go under the third seal, guess what? You really don't know what's taking place. You don't understand why the third seal and the fourth seal are just natural occurrences as a result of World War III. You have got to go back to the book of Ezekiel and you've got to understand the key nations that are involved in this, why they start the war, and why God is using it. Does that make sense? So, it's not an option. We have to do it. So, we're going to begin with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. So, turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Now, how many of you ever had a dream that was either so frightening or maybe it was so vivid or maybe it was just so powerful that it woke you up? Anyone ever had those type of dreams? I've had those type of dreams. I think everyone has. Well, that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. It was so powerful, it was so vivid that when he woke up from it, he was troubled. The word troubled is translated from the Hebrew word pa'am, which means to disturb or to upset. So basically, the dream really upset him. He must have just stood up in his bed, and he's probably having sweat running down his face. And he was upset by it, and we know he was really upset because he immediately summoned the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. Look at verse number 2. 
Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. Now, let me explain these four groups of people, all right? Magicians were what we would call fortune tellers. They claimed to have the ability to tell the future. It could be with cards, it could be with animals' bones, but you would come to them and they would be able to tell your future, what's going to take place. Astrologers also claimed to be able to foretell future events, but they did it by studying the stars. Sorcerers claimed to be able to communicate with the dead. They also practiced what we call magic. In other words, they used potions and they would cast spells. They were what you thought of when you thought of Merlin back in King Arthur's day, right? A sorcerer. And last but not least, you had the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans are interesting. Chaldeans were what we would call scientists. They studied the sciences. But they were also philosophers. In other words, they loved wisdom, so they studied philosophy. And if the king wanted to know what was the wise thing to do, he would summon the Chaldeans. He didn't care about the magicians. He didn't care about the sorcerers or the astrologers unless he thought there was something in the future that he should know. So what he would do is he would call his, his, the Chaldeans in the wise men and he would say, I've got a dilemma, or I've got a problem. And he would lay it out for them and then they would come up with wise things for him to do. And then he would check it with what the stars said. And he would check it with the magicians. Could they foretell what would happen? Well, of course, these three groups are listening to the wise men. And they're trying to make it vague enough that they can please the king, but if it doesn't turn out like the king expects it to, they still won't be in trouble. Does that make sense? And so that's these four group of people. Now, or groups of people. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were a part of this group. Now, probably the majority of you are not familiar with those names, are you? But you are familiar with the Babylonian names that were given to them. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and here in the south we say Abednego, but it's actually Abednego, all right? Now, after the king summoned these four groups to his chambers, he told them that he had a dream, but he couldn't remember it. Now, that's one view. Most scholars believe that he couldn't remember it, but you know, it really doesn't say that. If you read through it, one of two things happened. Either he couldn't remember it, or he purposely didn't want to tell them because it was so important, he knew that these people were all the time trying to blow smoke at him. Does that make sense? So we're going to look at it like he couldn't remember. So he wanted them to tell him what he had dreamed, and he wanted them to tell him what the interpretation of it was. And if they couldn't do that, he said, I will kill you, and I will turn your houses into rubble. And when he said houses into rubble, he meant, I'm going to wipe out your family. I'm going to take all your possessions and to send a message to everyone, we're going to destroy your house. So when everyone walks by that, they're going to know what happened and why. He could do that. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king. Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, Now I'm serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was, and you don't tell me what it means, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. Now, without being disrespectful, what did they do? Well, they told Nebuchadnezzar, you're crazy. No one can do that. No man can tell anyone what they've dreamed. We just don't have the ability to do that. Only God can do that. So they tried to reason with Nebuchadnezzar. If he could tell them what he dreamed, then they could interpret the dream. And that's when it hit Nebuchadnezzar. And maybe he knew this all along. He realized if they couldn't tell him what he dreamed, that really meant they couldn't interpret it. Once they heard the dream, he knew that they'd just make something up. 
that sounded reasonable, that sounded good. Yeah, that sounds like that works. The only true way to know if they were interpreting the dream correctly was if they could also tell him what he had dreamed. And that's what he demanded them. Demanded of them. He said, tell me what I've dreamed, and then you can tell me what the interpretation of it is. And if you can't do that, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to put every one of you to death. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 7 through 13. They said again, please, your majesty, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. The king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time. Because you know I'm serious when I say, if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I'm going to change my mind. But tell me the dream. And then I'll know for sure that you can tell me what it means. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any of his magicians, enchanters, or astrologers. Now they're trying to play on that. No king has ever done this before, and it's not right for you to demand this or to expect this. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. The king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent out, or sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. Now that's very important for you to see that. Daniel must not have been with them because verse 13 tells us that they had to send men to find Daniel and his friends. Now I believe personally that there's a reason that Daniel wasn't with them. Had Daniel been with them, I know what he would have done. He would have told the king, just wait for a minute and let me go pray. And I'm sure God's going to tell me, because he had a relationship with God, what you dreamed, and I'll be able to tell you what you dreamed, and I'll be able to interpret that. And then what would have happened is all the other groups would have been off the hook. Or the other groups could have claimed, well, I could have done that, but since Daniel stepped forward and he beat me to it, I'll let him do it. But you know, I truly believe That God wanted to make sure that everyone admitted they couldn't do it before Daniel stepped forward. So Daniel went to the king and he told him that if he gave him just a little bit of time and allowed him to pray, he'd not only tell him the dream, he'd tell him the interpretation of it. Look at Daniel chapter 2 verse 16. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. That's really interesting because this has to do with the book of Revelation. You're going to find that out in the next two to three weeks. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an all-night prayer meeting. You might call it a do-or-die meeting. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now, sometime during the night, sometime while they were praying, Daniel had a vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He actually saw what what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Look at verse number 19. It says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel... In a night vision. Now this doesn't mean in a dream. It is a vision. It is an open eyed trance. But it happened at night. Literally he was able to see. What Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And I want you to notice. That last little part of that verse. Daniel didn't rush off to the king. Immediately. Uh Uh-uh. After he received the vision. What did he do? He started worshiping God. And you'll find that in verses 20 through 23. But because we want to move on, we're not going to look at that. And then, only after he continued to worship God, didn't matter how dire the situation was, didn't matter that his neck was on the line, God gave him the answer, God deserved the worship. So he began to worship God. And when he finished his worship time, then and only then did he go off to see the king. Look at verse 26 through 30. 
The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Now notice he says, is this true? Why did he say that? Because when the captain of the guard came in, you know what he said? I have found someone who can interpret the dream. You know, everyone wants to take credit. Have you ever noticed that? He wanted the king to know, you know, you're really upset. That bothered me, king. I love you. You know I love you like a brother. So I've been looking for someone who can do that. And I found someone who can do that. So, of course, when Daniel comes in, that's why Nebuchadnezzar says, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven. And this God in heaven reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now, I will tell you your dream, the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secrets of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. Now, I want you to notice what Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar. He told him, you dreamed about coming events. And he told him that God was showing him through this dream what will happen in the future. That's why this is important to the book of Revelation. What Daniel is going to reveal, the interpretation of this dream has a bearing on the book of Revelation. There are certain things we know. We know that there's going to be ten federated kingdoms that's going to rise up out of the revived Roman Empire. How do we know that? The book of Daniel. We know that the Antichrist will come from one of those ten kingdoms. How do we know that? The book of Daniel. We know that a peace treaty is going to take place. How do we know that? The book of Daniel. You see, all the way back then, around 600 B.C., God revealed the events that were going to happen. But God did something else, which I love. He also revealed other events that has no bearing on that. And he laid out in detail what would happen. And the reason he did that is so that we can look back and say, Oh my gosh, it happened just the way God said it would. And now when we look to the future of what has yet to come to pass, we can know with certainty it will come to pass. Because when we look back in history, what God prophesied, what God said would come to pass, did to the letter. Does that make sense? Now, that's very, very important that you realize that God was telling Nebuchadnezzar what was going to happen in the future. Now, about 90% of what was in the dream has already happened. It happened over the next 900 years from about 600 BC to about 364 AD. And it happened just like Daniel said it would happen. As I said, perfectly, to a T. You can look back and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. That's why so many liberal scholars actually reject the book of Daniel. Do you know why they reject the book of Daniel? Because when they study history, they say, hey, hey that's not possible. No man could predict the future so accurately and with so many details unless someone actually did it after all the events took place and then he only claimed that another person way back in time predicted it. And that's why you see these liberal uh, scholars say, well, Daniel didn't write that, it was someone, blah, blah, blah. But there's no proof of that. In fact, we can go back and we can find proof that no, the person who penned this was Daniel. And who lived at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And he died before any of these events that he prophesied, with the exception of one. And he only got to see it come to fruition but all the rest of the events he died before they ever happened but he prophesied them because God had revealed the future to him now as I said 90% of what Daniel said would happen has already occurred but 10% of what he said would happen hasn't happened yet it has yet to be fulfilled now guess when it's going to be fulfilled in the tribulation. 
The part that has yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled during the tribulation. And it's amazing how John's revelation ties right into Daniel's revelation. In fact, Daniel actually supplies information that makes the book of Revelation understandable. In other words, if we did not have the book of Daniel, we wouldn't understand a lot of the things that John wrote in the book of Revelation. But because of the book of Daniel, it all makes sense. It all fits together. And now as we begin to look at all of these events that's going to take place, and we go back to the book of Daniel, we go, oh man, that's the missing key. Oh, that's the part that he was talking about. Oh, can you believe this? John prophesies the very same thing, but he sees it differently. It's a different vision, but it has the very same meaning. How cool. That's the way it is. It's kind of like the key the book of Daniel is in the book of, of uh, Ezekiel. It's the key that unlocks the book of Revelation. Now, let's look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the interpretation of the dream. And you need to understand, as we study this, there's only a small portion of it that really applies to Revelation of this dream. All right? But we're going to see that Daniel had other visions. But we also need to study those so we understand that if God said this is going to happen, and it did, how much more confident can we be that what he's saying in Revelation is going to take place? All right, so let's look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and then we'll look at the interpretation. Look at verses 31 through 35. Here Daniel is telling him what he dreamed. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge, shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Now the reason it was frightening is because it was a huge statue of a man. It wasn't a little bitty statue. This thing was huge. And it says the head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs. Now that's really not a good, uh, a good translation. Really what it's saying is its belly and it goes around and says its belly buttocks all right they just didn't want to say that neither did of the other translators so it doesn't say that but no it's the abdomen and the buttocks all right its leg oh its belly and thighs or buttocks were bronze its legs were iron and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay as you watched a rock was cut from a mountain but not by human hands who do you think could be the rock What's the name of our church? Who's the cornerstone? All right, a rock is cut out of a mountain, all right? I'm just kind of giving you a little tidbit. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace. You couldn't find a piece of it. Wow. Like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain. Now notice this. That covered the whole earth. Now that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And this is a picture of what he saw. We're going to put it up here. It's on the back of your study sheet. This is a picture. Now I'm not saying it looked just like this. The person who drew this, Clarence Larkin, Basically what he did is he went back and he looked at some of the things that they had back then and what kings looked like and things that they wore in different empires. But this is probably something like that. And if you notice, the head is what? It's gold. Now we come in and we see the chest and the arms are silver. Then we see that the abdomen, and we can't see it, but it goes around to the back, is brass. And then we see the legs are iron and then we get to the feet and the toes. And it's a different substance too. It's made up of a part of the iron. It's made of baked clay and iron for the feet and toes. Now, let's look at the interpretation. Verse, verses 36 through 38. That was the dream. Now, we will tell the king what it means. Now, like he said, we will tell the king. Who's we? Well, God is using Daniel. He wants him to understand, it's not I, it's not me, I'm not the big cheese here. You need to understand, 
We will tell you what it means. But the only reason it's we is because God is the one who has revealed this. So even though I'm speaking, I want you to understand it's God. So now we will tell the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings and he's not just flattering him. Not only did he conquer so much and some of the other empires conquered just as much, but none of them were as wealthy. And the things that we find out as we study that empire, it was unbelievable. All right? He says, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You're the head of gold. Now, I want you to notice that Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom is represented by the head of gold. So the Babylonian Empire, his kingdom is the head. But here's what's kind of interesting. If the others were making up an interpretation for the dream, if one of the sorcerers had or the astrologers or the magicians, I'm sure that the interpretation would have been all about Nebuchadnezzar and there wouldn't have been anything bad about him. You didn't want to tick the king off. But you know, Daniel's going to tell him the truth. And he wants him to know that your kingdom is not going to remain. Your kingdom is going to go down. And another kingdom is going to take your place. It's going to be replaced. Look at verses 39 through 45. But after your kingdom comes to an end, because it will, King Nebuchadnezzar, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. Now, how do we know it's inferior? When we go back to that, if you notice, the chest and the arms are made out of what substance? Silver. Silver is not as valuable as gold. All right? So, uh, if your yours will rise to your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, will rise to rule the world. Now, each time the substance changes, it represents a new kingdom. I want you to notice that as we go through this. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay. Now remember, every time we change substances, a new kingdom comes. Now we're changing substances, but we're actually adding something and there's a piece of the ode, which tells us that this kingdom is actually going to disappear, but it's going to be revived. All right, I want you to see that. Now, this is showing that this kingdom will be divided like iron mixed with clay. It will have some of the strength of iron, but while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage. But they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. During the reigns of those kings, what kings? There's ten toes, five toes on each foot. Those toes represent who? Kings. So he says, during the reigns of those kings, the ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. This tells us when these kings will reign. When are these kings going to reign? It tells us. During the time of the reigns, God is going to set up his kingdom on earth. Now, when is God's kingdom going to be set up on earth? At the end of the tribulation. You're right. That thousand year millennial period. It's going to cover the entire earth. That rock's going to come up. It's going to smash every kingdom. All kingdoms. There's not going to be a trace of any man's kingdom. Because the kingdom of God's going to come in. And it's going to grow so much it's going to cover the entire earth. But the kingdom of God is going to set up the kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. But he tells us when. During the reigns of those kings. So he's going to come at the end of the tribulation. But it's during the reign of those kings. So when are those kings going to reign? They're going to reign during the tribulation. What does that tell us? That the fourth kingdom, which we now know is gone is going to be revived. It's going to come up. And that kingdom is going to consist of ten smaller kingdoms. 
They're going to be a federation of kingdoms. And they're going to rise up, which we're going to find out in just a minute, out of the Roman Empire. That's why you hear all of these prophecy teachers when they're teaching on it. You just never knew why. He talked about the ten federated kings of the revived Roman Empire is going to bring the Antichrist in or onto the scene. And you hear all that, but you don't know why. Daniel tells us. Let's go further. It will crush. Now, what's it? God's kingdom. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands. That crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true. And I'm here to tell you, Nebuchadnezzar, its meaning is certain. And the reason he filled us in on the other three kingdoms that really have nothing to do with what we're talking about is because he wanted us to know as we looked back through history that what God said would come to pass came to pass exactly the way he said it would. You remember when we were teaching on the 70 weeks and God predicted to the very day when Jesus Christ would come in Jerusalem as the Messiah, Palm Sunday. To the very day it was there. And he also said he would be cut off. But not for his own sins, but for us. He was. Everything that he, he prophesied came to pass to the very day. It's the same way in this dream. Because God wants us to know that he's able to see the future. And he can lay out the future and he tells you exactly what's going to take place. And it does. But the reason he does that is because there are some things that haven't yet come to pass in this dream. That's the part that we're going to focus in on as we go through the book of Revelation. But we must know that the dream is true and its meaning is certain. So, let's kind of recap. The statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw symbolized the four, world, or the four great world empires of the ancient world. From the time of Babylon until the time of Christ and a little bit after. Now, the reason... All the other empires that have come since the Roman Empire aren't put here. It's because they have nothing to do with Israel. They have nothing to do with the time of the Gentiles, which Daniel is concerned about. Does that make sense? So we're not going to hear about the British Empire. We're only going to hear about the other or the revived Roman Empire because that has to do with us and that has to do with Israel. And we need to know that. Now, the last empire, as we're going to see, will also or also disappeared. But it's going to rise again, as I've already said, as a ten-nation federation. And it's going to rise again shortly before the tribulation and in that tribulation. Does that make sense? And the Antichrist will come out of this ten-nation federation. Now, in verse number 38, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that his empire was the golden head of the statue. But he didn't tell Nebuchadnezzar who the other empires were. Did you notice that? Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar could care less. He only wanted to know what the dream meant in relationship to him. He knew it had something to do with him. And once he heard the dream and once he saw what was taking place, he understood something. Hey, my kingdom's going to disappear, but not in my lifetime. Okay, I'm no longer upset. Good job, Daniel. And guess what he does? He promotes Daniel. And the reason he promotes him is because here's a man that can tell me what it really means. And I know because I didn't tell him what the dream was. He told me what the dream was. And I remember, Jess, that's exactly what I did dream. And he didn't, he didn't spare anything. He didn't try to suck up to me. No, he told me exactly what's going to happen. But he didn't care about the other kingdoms. He just wanted to know about him. And that's why the other kingdoms are not told. But we do know who the other empires are and not just because of history. And we also know what order they would come. And he gave his details about them. And the reason we know that is because Daniel had other visions. And in those visions, he gave more details. In the vision of the ram and the he-goat. How many of you ever heard of the vision of the ram and the he-goat? One, two, three. How many never heard of the vision of the ram and the he-goat? How many never read the book of Daniel? It's hard, it's hard to understand. I understand that. But as I begin to break it down, you're going to find out it's very easy. It's really not that difficult. It's really not that hard to understand. But in the vision of the ram and the he-goat in Daniel chapter 8, we're going to find out who the next two kingdoms are. Now, we don't have time to study that vision tonight. We're going to do that next Wednesday night. 
But I am going to jump ahead. How many of you like to cheat every once in a while? When you're reading a book, you, you just turn to the end just to make sure it turns out right. Anyone ever do that? Because you don't really want to read the book and find out that was a crappy ending, right? Just kind of depresses me and makes me feel bad. I want something that's going to end good, right? Well, you know, we're going to go through it, but I'm going to kind of jump ahead, and I'm going to at least tell you who the other kingdoms are and in what order they appeared. And then as we go through the vision of the ram and the he-goat and we see some of the other visions, you're going to go, oh, my gosh. How did Daniel do that? He didn't. God did. God just told him what was going to take place. So let me do that. After the Babylonian Empire, you had the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medes and the Persians actually formed an alliance, but the Persians were the stronger of the two. They are the ones, or, or th this alliance, they were the ones that defeated the Babylonians, and they became the next great world empire. They are represented by the two arms of the statue. Now, when you see the two arms of the statue, the right arm is the Persians, the left arm is the Medes. It's silver. Not because it didn't conquer as much uh, land. It's not because they didn't have more people underneath them in servitude. It's because they weren't as wealthy. And a lot of that is because they actually shared it between two. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that. Nebuchadnezzar was the sovereign ruler. You know how we know how great his power was? If you've ever read through the book of Daniel, you'll find out that in his pride, God struck him down. And he literally went insane for seven years. Did you know that? And he ran around thinking that he was an ox. He actually ate the grass. And he would be outside and the dude would come on. And no one in the kingdom acted like anything was wrong. That's how powerful he was. And because he did like things like this in the dream where he would test. See, I really believe that he did remember the dream. That was just a test. They were probably going, he's testing us again. The moment we try to remove him, he's going to pop up and go, ah, caught you, and we're going to be killed. So people just kind of acted like nothing was strange, nothing was wrong, and he ran around like a beast for seven years. Did you know that? And immediately, just as God predicted, he came out of it. And he ruled shortly after that, but when he came out of it, he had a whole different attitude. God broke him. And let me tell you, the God of Israel was promoted. He gave place to God. He gave honor to God. All right? Now, when the Medes and Persians formed this alliance, now they had to share the wealth between two. Does that make sense? So their kingdom is silver. The next empire was the Grecian Empire. Daniel even predicted that the Grecian Empire let me go a little bit further, would be divided into four kingdoms. And of course, we know what happened after Alexander the Great died. If you remember, Alexander the Great was unbelievable. He had smaller armies, but he could get, he could get to the battle so quick that his enemy, enemies could not prepare for him. In fact, it was a different type of warfare. And they were used to, when they would see an enemy coming to attack them, they thought, well, you know, we have plenty of time, and they would start uh, preparing for battle. But when they found out that Alexander the Great was coming, they would come and say, he's coming. They start preparing for battle. And before they knew it, he was there. And they were caught surprised. It happened time after time after time. And Alexander the Great just literally went through and, I mean, he conquered everyone. And, of course, we all know the story. You know, here he is, a young man, early 30s. And he has no more world uh, or no more countries to conquer. And he's depressed because that's his purpose. And, of course, supposedly in his depression, he stays out in the storm, and, you know, he gets sick, and he dies as a result of sick. But he was. He, he, he died shortly in his 30s, about 33. And what's interesting is his kingdom was divided between four of his generals. And it happened exactly like Daniel predicted in the vision of the ram and the he-goat. We're going to see that a little bit later, all right? And the fourth great empire, represented by iron was the Roman Empire. It's represented by iron because the Roman Empire, they reigned with an iron fist. Anyone remember that phrase? I'm telling you, if you stepped out of line, you paid the price. And you can see what they would do. 
In 70 AD, when they tore Jerusalem down, I mean they burned the city. They made an example, and the few that ran off to Masada, I mean, everyone else would have said, Psh, there's not enough to remain. But no, they had to make an example of everyone. And when Rome was at its strongest, when it's at the pinnacle of its strength, it made sure that if anyone stepped out of line, we made an example of you so you would know. That's why when Jesus was taken outside of the city, and if you go to Israel with me, we'll go to the place of the skull. It is, I'm telling you, it's right outside the city walls. We'll turn around and we'll see the old city right there. But you know why they did that? Because everyone who passed by and they saw a person crucified, they said, that's what happens when you come against Rome. Rome ruled with an iron fist. They crushed everyone. And if they were ever defeated, they just sent more troops because they never let it get out that they could be defeated until they got weaker in the years to come. And then, of course, they dissolve. They, they actually go away too. Anyways, the two legs of the statue represent the Roman Empire. This implied what? you got two legs. What does two legs mean? With the Medo-Persians, one's the Persians, one's the Medes. you got two arms because you have two kings. you have two legs. What does this tell us? That the Roman Empire is going to have a division of two. Did that happen? Well, if yes. Of course it did. That's exactly what happened. The Roman Empire was divided in two parts in 364 A.D. Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Division, and Rome was the capital of the Western Division. Now, here's what's interesting. The Roman Empire has disappeared. But in the vision, the two legs of the statue has ten toes. Those ten toes have never come to fruition. That symbolizes, symbolizes that the Roman Empire is going to eventually divide into ten kingdoms. And that this Roman Empire is going to be revived. And it's going to consist of these ten federated kingdoms. And from this future empire, what do we know because of the book of Daniel? The kingdom, if you remember, when we were teaching on the 70 weeks, and it said that this Antichrist is going to do the peace treaty, and then what is he going to do? In the middle of it, yes, he's going to back out of it. He's going to say, I'm God, and he's going to want to be. But here's what's interesting. It tells you the people that he's going to come from. It says, and the people who do this, he comes from the people who do the thing that he predicted in the 70 weeks, that the temple's going to be destroyed. You remember it said the temple's going to be destroyed? The temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the Antichrist is going to come up out of the Roman Empire. He's going to come out of the ten toes that's in this statue. Does that make sense? All right. And of course, Daniel tells us he's going to make a peace treaty with Israel. He's going to allow them to rebuild the temple. And that's the first seal. But here's what most people don't realize. When the Antichrist first comes on the scene, not every nation's going to back him. And most of you have been taught that, haven't you? Uh-uh. There's going to be some nations that's going to challenge him. There's going to be some nations that's going to form an alliance, and Russia is going to head it. His leader is referred to as Gog. The country that he leads is who? Magog. Right? And he's going to form an alliance, and we're going to look at all of the nations that he forms an alliance with. And guess what? They are going to attack Israel. They're not going to attack the Antichrist. They're going to attack Israel. Why? Because it's at the very beginning of the tribulation. It is now the second seal when the nuclear war takes place. Does that make sense? But we don't want to study World War III until you understand the nations that are involved. Because if you don't understand the nations that are involved and you don't understand the details, guess what? It's just something that you've memorized, something that you learned in school and you don't really understand, but you know the right answer. We don't want to do that. By the time we get through the book of Revelation, you're going to understand it if you come regularly. If you go home and you listen and you study, I promise you by the time we get through the book of Revelation, you'll go, what? That is not what everyone told me. That is not too hard to understand. 
we can understand that and we can see what's going to happen. It's, I'm not going to say simple because you have to think. But it is not too difficult and I'll tell you why. Because God is the one who has revealed it. But he makes us study to understand it.